Rodney Gardner was singing the praises of some of his defensive linemen yesterday. That was a little weird. We don't see that from Rodney Gardner an awful lot. What's that say about Tennessee's defensive line group? And, and conversely, what can it mean about Tennessee's offensive line right now? That and a whole lot more at your Wednesday Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into it, your Wednesday edition of Locked On Vols. Appreciate you for being here. I'm your host, Eric Kane, at underscore Kaner on Twitter, at Locked On Vols. Uh, appreciate you guys making Locked On Vols your first listen. Every dayers literally couldn't do it without you. Got a fun show coming up. We're going to hear a lot of comments and some, see some video if you're watching on YouTube. Remember, 8K by opening day. Go ahead and subscribe to Locked On Vols on the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Going to see a whole lot of video and audio from Tennessee defensive line coach Rodney Garner. I don't mean to bring so much of it onto the show today, and a lot of people might think, oh, he's lazy. He just wants us to play audio and everything. It's actually more editing uh, to get all this up there. But I think a lot of it is good. I really, really do. So I'm going to shut up, kind of kind of play these clips, and, and then react to them and, and see what you think, because I think a lot of them are are really, really good. Going to hear from Rodney Gardner here in a matter of seconds, a little bit in segment two. Kevin Steele, defensive coordinator of Alabama. Some interesting comments, and I think we know who we're talking about when you listen to them. That coming up in segment two, Ward Wednesday. Josh Ward will join us in segment three. The two biggest takeaways from Rodney Gardner's media appearance on uh, on um, on Tuesday was two veterans and how they're having some pretty good starts to camp and how they had incredible off seasons two guys that if they play to their potential i think the sky's the limit defensively well i don't say that i think the sky's the limit for them but it can really move the needle a lot for this defensive line and in turn the defense for tennessee first we're going to hear a bit of a lengthy clip this is on elijah simmons Longtime defensive tackle. This is his fifth year here in Knoxville. He's been here a while from the mid-state. So talented, big boy, super athletic, but it's never truly clicked. He has had a number change going from 51 to number 10. What's that mean and how's he looked so far? Here's Rodney Garner speaking on Elijah Simmons. Elijah, you know, he, he is a powerful big man. Um, you know, he does have initial quickness, short area quickness. He's got built-in pad level and leverage. You know, he's just got to learn to – his biggest enemy is just, you know, is when fatigue sets in, you know. You know, when he gets tired, you know, you know, you know, I mean, everybody knows he switched his number to 10. You know, and like I'm saying, if you're a D lineman wearing 10, you need to be elite. You know, so, you know, so my challenge to him – you know, sometimes 10 shows up to practice, sometimes 51 shows up, you know, so we just got to figure out who, who you are, what you want to be, you know. So, you know, 10 and 51 are different guys. So, you know, if he's going to be 10, then he needs to get himself in really, really good shape and be able to play out the whole game like 10. Well, I think, you know, all the, obviously, you know, just getting into better shape, growing, uh, maturing, uh, you know, maybe even feeling, you know, somewhat, you know, unfulfilled, you know, just – because he's a guy, you know, he'd sit there and tell you, when I first came and first met him, got around him, I was like, man, man, you remind me so much of Geno Atkins. You know, I thought he's going to be like that, you know, or just, you know, just that initial quickness, that short area quickness, that explosiveness. You know, he just reminded me of Geno, who I had at, at Georgia. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, he would start out always – with a bang, but then some kind of way, some along the line, he hit a little adversity and would always fade away, you know. So hopefully, you know, he had a great spring. I um, mean, why didn't he say a great spring? He had a really good spring. Uh, and like I told him in the evaluation after spring ball, the challenge was going to be, was he going to pick up where he left off in spring or were we going to start all the way back over again? You know, so, you know, so that, you know, I can tell you, Thus far through camp, you know, he's really having a really good start of camp. So, you know, and I think he sees that. So hopefully he's gained a little bit of more confidence. Hopefully he likes, you know, the direction he's heading in. And we all just got to keep encouraging and pushing and prodding and all that. It's just like I told the guys the other day, you know, obviously if you, if you can't push yourself, 
then you need to be a, a man enough to be able to allow others to push you. Because there's some guys that can't push themselves, but then they got to allow their teammates to push them or allow their coaches to push them. But now if you can't push yourself and you won't allow others to push you, then we got a problem. You know, Then we're not going to be able to get where we want to get to. And I think now he is allowing you know, his teammates to push him uh, when he hits that wall. He's allowing the coaching to push him in the right direction and not let it be all the negativity thing. So, so I, hopefully he's growing and maturing in that, in that area right there. Boy, you love to hear that, don't you? Man, if you can get Elijah Simmons clicking and playing, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 snaps a game, helping that defensive line out, not only just another body, but he's good. He's explosive. But as Rodney Garner just said, you know, when the fatigue starts wearing in, that's his worst enemy. And so he's had an incredible spring, a great summer, a great start to fall camp. And he's buying into what's going on right now, knowing that this is his last opportunity before the National Football League. I love the number switch as well. New me, new number. That's what Elijah Simmons said to us on Tuesday, 51-10, to 10, and you're starting to play like it. If he, if he can click, uh, this defensive line could be dangerous, in my opinion, just another weapon. Because honestly, you haven't been able to rely on him at all throughout his Tennessee career, but you know the potential. One other guy that, t that has made some plays for Tennessee, he's made some big-time plays and big-time moments, but durability has been an issue as well. A guy that's been here a while, a, a you know mid-state kid that played senior year at Knoxville Catholic, Tyler Barron, one of the most talented players on the team, in my opinion, but he's never truly reached his full potential. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he does this year. He's off to a good start, and Rodney Gardner couldn't say enough nice things. Surprisingly, again, he doesn't compliment much about Tyler Barron and Tuesday's media availability. Well, I think he's matured, uh, you know, a lot, and uh, I think he's just, he's grown, you know, as a young man, uh, and I think he's bought in more, <clears throat> you know, to the team concept, and just and I think he's being more of a team guy, more of a Tennessee guy than than a Tyler guy, and, you know, and then I think he's starting to see that if Tennessee does well then Tyler Barron's going to do well. You know what I'm saying? But if Tennessee does poorly, then odds are, you know, Tyler Barron's not going to do as well. So, and that's everybody. That's not just Tyler. Uh, that's everybody just, you know, getting them to understand that, you know, this is a, uh, a, a team a team sport. Uh, and it, it's the greatest, you know, the greatest team sport out there. And just, you know, them understanding, you know, how blessed they are to have an opportunity to play at a program like this, to play in this conference, to play with the type of young men that they're playing with, you know, that we're just all truly blessed and we just need to understand that, you know, these are once in a lifetime opportunities. So we need to bond together. You know, we work extremely hard, but if we want to, we need to bond together and make it special, you know, because, you know, if we're all pulling the rope in the same direction, then we definitely got an opportunity to do some special things. Really like that. Basically saying, hey, Tyler Barron has bought in. Tyler Barron has finally stopped doing things the way that he wants to do them, and he's doing things the way that I want him and the fellow coaches and what Tennessee wants him to do. And I love how he said, you know, if Tennessee does well, you know, chances are Tyler Barron's doing well as well. If Tennessee does poorly, chances are Tyler Barron's not having a great year as well. And so I thought those were huge. I thought those were big-time uh, comments from Rodney Gardner on Tyler Barron because, again, he's always been one of the most talented guys in the room. So the point is, that's why I played these two clips first. If Tennessee can get those two guys to play up to their potential to empty the tank, I think the sky's the limit for this defensive line. I truly, truly do. I got a couple more comments from Rodney Gardner. Again, a little lengthy comments and videos uh, from Garner on today's show because, again, there's a lot to unravel because I think that they're really, really good. We'll get into that. We'll hear what Kevin Steele had to say, subtweeting essentially about the University of Tennessee. That's coming up next. Well, of course, we'll have Josh Ward in segment number three. But before we get into all that, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bird Dogs. All right, Bird Dogs, they truly make you look good. They have stretch khaki shorts designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you truly a sculpted look. Hey-oh. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, 
but they fit way better. They fit better because regular shorts are made of stiff, restricting cotton, but Bird Dogs fix that issue by inventing a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get that way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs also uses an anti-sweat swipping uh, fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. I got a pair of Bird Dog shorts. I got a pair of Bird Dog socks. I just got a couple pairs of both. And they're I, I call them the do anything, go anywhere clothing, right? Because if you're going to a meeting, a business meeting, a lunch meeting, you're going to church, you're going to the bar with the boys, going on a date with the wife, whatever the case may be, uh, versatility is the name of the game and comfort, and it makes you look super, super good as well. What I need you to do right now is go to Bird Dogs, or rather, I encourage you right now, go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. Enter that promo code locked on college while you're there, and you'll get a free white tech hat with your order. I don't, I, I got it laying around here somewhere. I got mine the other day. I've already worn it a couple of times out. Wore it at UT football practice the other day with the sun in my eyes. It looks sweet. That's a birddogs.com slash locked on college. Use that promo code locked on college for a free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. I promise you that. Hey guys, thanks for being here on a Wednesday locked on balls. You everydayers couldn't do it without you and want to take a quick moment you know, thoughts and prayers to anyone affected by it turned out to be a tornado in East Tennessee right here in Knox County um, on Tuesday or on, uh, let's see here, yeah, Monday afternoon. Um, I was uh, kind of behind the curtain. I was in here recording the VolQuest podcast. I was having to mute my microphone because um, the thunder and the, and the lightning, it was uh, the thunder was so loud and the rain hitting up against the house and my tin roof. And, um, you know, I lost, uh, I lost power for a little bit and I lost internet for overnight, but I mean, I've seen some of the pictures and, and some of the houses and the apartment complex and all the trees going down and people without power. Man, I just, if you were affected by that, I uh, hope you guys are doing well. And uh, man, that's that's some scary stuff. So uh, those August storms, you never want to see them. But of course, it hit home right here on Monday. Hope everyone's doing okay in that regard. All right, so I want to continue on here. We're going to get to some comments from Kevin Steele some really interesting comments from Alabama defensive coordinator Kevin Steele here in a moment, but there's a couple more Rodney Garner clips I want to play and comment on because, again, he had a lot of great stuff on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, here's what he had to say about Omar Norman Lott, defensive lineman coming over from Arizona State. Uh, he was here in the spring, didn't hear an awful lot about him, but you're hearing a whole lot of buzz over the summer and, and into fall camp that, hey, this guy's going to be a player. It's really going to help Tennessee on the interior of the defensive line. Here's Rodney Garner on what he had to say about Omar Norman Lott. Well, you know, obviously I definitely think um, Omar Lott is definitely an upgrade for us. Uh, he's a young man that's got, you know, you know, a body of work, you know, even though it's in a different conference. Uh, so he's got a little bit more maturity to him. And then when you sit there and look at this kid, you know, he has uh, a, a skill set. You know, he, he has power. He has initial quickness. Uh, you know, he knows how to maneuver his body and slip and just naturally make some plays. He can really run. Uh, the thing I thought, you know, initially coming into camp, I thought he may have been just a tad bit, you know, too heavy. Uh, and I think, you know, now he's starting to trim down and, and his athleticism is starting to show even more, which I think as he continues to really get himself into better shape, I think we will see – a, even a much better product than what he's shown thus far. I think Tennessee will take that any day of the week, right? A, a guy that has a whole lot of athletic, athleticism trimming up a little bit so you can see more of that athleticism, trying to get out the passer from the interior. I think Omar Norman Lotz can help Tennessee out in a big way. What about those Leos? Been talking about those a lot. Roman Harrison, uh, Joshua Josephs. Those two guys played a little bit with Byron Young last year. So you see that you play – you're going to play three Leos at least, right? Especially in pass rushing situations. What about James Pierce and, and freshman Caleb Herring? How's that group? What's it look like now compared to what it did look like when Rodney Gardner first got here? And what are the implications for those guys to help that front four um, you know, this year and getting after the passer? Here's what Rodney Gardner had to say about the Leo position or the edge position for the University of Tennessee. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, you got linked. You know, you got athleticism. Uh, you know, you, you're starting to, uh, you know, you're looking like uh, a championship caliber room supposed to look. Uh, you know, so, you know, obviously we all got to continue to get stronger. Uh, we all got to continue to get more explosive. 
Uh, we've all got to be more conscientious of our fundamentals and our, and our technique and all those different things. Uh, but I do like uh, the athleticism, and uh, I like the guys being willing to buy in. And, uh, and I like the guys, you know, really at, uh, as of this point, you know, not, not showing self, uh, selfishness, you know, that, you know, they're starting to think about their teammates, starting to think about the program, you know, and putting others first. You know, like I said, if we can do that, then I think we can achieve a lot of good things. And then there's going to be a lot more rewards for everybody to go around, you know, if we'll put the team first. The Leos have got to hit for Tennessee in order for this defense to take another step. We always talk about the back end and the secondary. Uh, it's all tied together, guys. Um, it's all tied together, and you can't be reliant on blitzes from the second and the third level. Having an explosive Leo to not only you know duplicate or try to duplicate what Robert Young did, but also take that next step and not just let it be a one-man show. Um, have a couple different threats out there. The Leo position is going to be critical in that regard, and so... Uh, again, he said it once right there, and he's going to say it again here in a moment when I play this next clip. Championship caliber, you know, this, the room is starting to look like what a championship caliber team and program looks like. And so I think that speaks volume. Again, I love the makeup of this Leo room. You know, Roman Harrison's going to play. He's going to be the quote-unquote starter, right? But, you know, long, lengthy. Those other three guys are long, lengthy, and athletic. Caleb Herring, James Pierce, and Joshua Josephs. Uh, finally, the last thing I'm going to play from Rodney Garner. We've heard a lot from him today, but overall, the culture of the room, what it looks like now compared to what it did look like. And of course, he's coached a whole lot of football. He's coached a whole lot of NFL talent, and he speaks highly of his room right now, which is uncharacteristic like of Rodney Garner. Give this a listen on what his room looks like and the culture changing now entering year three in the system. Uh, along the lines of uh, you know, changing the culture of the room, I do feel like we are moving the room in a uh, in the right direction. You know, now we've got peers holding each other accountable. And that's what you want. You know, if you're ever going to have a championship caliber program or team, you got to have the leadership coming from within. And now you're seeing guys start to hold each other more accountable. And it's just not just the coaches where, you know, they're sitting there and say, hey, that's not our standard. That's not how we do things. And I think if we can keep moving it, moving in that direction, then we'll be able to achieve better, better results. I mean, Rodney Gardner literally says what's on his mind. Um, he is not – I mean, we, we, we always joke about it, and for those of us who get the view practice a little bit and report on it, you, you, you see him coach. He's very – uh, very animated, to say the least, but he's a good coach. And if you look past the yelling and all that, and of course he said he doesn't like the yell a lot, um, you know, he, he's really teaching you, and he's teaching you the right way, and he cares about you, and he's, you know, he's loving on you and everything. And so I thought Rodney Gardner was really good yesterday when he met with the media. Um, for him to say that many nice things, I think it kind of speaks volume to why the defensive line could end up being a strength for Tennessee because they're all veterans. They've all played a ton, right? And maybe that's a contributing factor. Who We'll touch base on this as the week goes on, but maybe a contributing factor to why the offensive line's been a little slow out of the gate because this defensive line is just really, really good. Uh, shifting gears here before we get into Josh Ward for Ward Wednesday, Kevin Steele, a longtime veteran SEC coordinator. <laughs> One time, you know, he and he and uh, Rodney Garner worked together for a long time over at Auburn, uh, just a couple years ago. But uh, Kevin Steele, VFL, played here, coached here, and everything. Of course, he came back during the the interim of uh, you know Jeremy Pruitt and Josh Heupel and all that. A lot of people don't like Kevin Steele, and that's fine. But he's been a coordinator and a defensive assistant for a long time in this league. He is a defensive guy. He's old school. He was asked about the changes of offensive and philosophy in the game of football right now. Listen to his answer, and I think you're going to know exactly who he's talking about. It is, it is a challenge defensively right now in terms of the, the tempo several years back kind of started the thing. Uh, and, and then the multiplicity of, of formations has gone off the roof in terms of that. Uh, you know, we even have people that they face – spread out any further they'd be on the sideline they'd be on the bench uh you know they're they're using the whole thing and so uh those kind of things that have happened but then also the rpos and then the look that the eye candy that goes with that uh play action type stuff where you've got pullers and running backs going opposite which that's not that's 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 going down the exit ramp all right that was kevin Steele. 
uh, Alabama defensive coordinator now. And as Jason Swain said on Josh and Swain, we'll hear from his co-host Josh Ward here in just a moment for Ward Wednesday. But as he said on the, the Josh and Swain program on Tuesday, at me, bro. Like, I don't, don't subtweet at me, right? <laughs> He's talking about Tennessee. Uh, of course, you know, not every, I mean, a lot of teams do RPO stuff, okay? But Tempo, Tennessee, the splits that he referenced, that's Tennessee, right? I mean, how many times have you watched this offense and you see these wide receivers all the way out to the numbers or tandems at the numbers? Why do you spread them out? Because you have to have a hat on a hat. You have to have a cornerback over there to um, to respect the wide out the, the the wide split of the wide receiver or a safety or a nickel, if not on the line of scrimmage, at least well over again to complement the two route combination over there from the top, and that allows to open up some run lanes, allows a lot of green grass for your offense to go and run. And so, I mean, I, I hear him. It has never been uh, easier, or excuse me, it has never been more difficult to play defense in college football than right now. I hear him. He's 100% right. Um, I, I'm, I'm an old school defender. I, I, I love defense. That's my passion, right? I love I love linebacker, I read, react, right? But defense is all about assignment football. You have your assignment, so go and take care of your assignment, execute, and then you can shut down. It's all reactionary, whereas offense, you have to execute a game plan, or you have to execute a game plan defensively too, but you have to execute a play call and all that, while defense, you have to stick to your assignment and react and go make a play. Um, I'm with them, but I mean, it's not going to change or anything, right? RPO has been a part of the game for a long time. Um, Tempo has been a part of the game for a long time. And I don't think he was complaining, really. I don't. I just think that he was more or less just talking about Tennessee and how difficult it is. So I would take that as a compliment if I'm a Tennessee fan, honestly. Um, you know, you can take it forever, you know, however you want to. But I thought those comments were very interesting there because he was point blank, specifically about the splits and the motion and all that. I mean, motion has been a part of football for a long time. But he's been ta- he's talking about Tennessee right there. So I wanted to play those comments for you and say, hey, you know, my reaction is, I hear you, bud, but um, it's, th- it's the name of the game. You've been coaching football since the 1970s. It's 2023. Um, if you don't like it, hang it up. But I'm not, I don't think he's saying that. I'm just saying I, I think that he's just kind of point- pointing out that the game's changed a lot. And-, and these offenses, like Josh Heupel's offense here at Tennessee, makes it incredibly difficult on defenders around the Southeastern Conference and, of course, around the country. Uh, tons of audio and video that we've heard from Rodney Garner. I thought he was fantastic yesterday, and I, thought, I think that speaks volumes to where the defensive line is as a group, veteran-led, of course, and it's my opinion that the defensive line will have a good day on Thursday's scrimmage and tomorrow's scrimmage. Of course, defense is typically ahead of the offense at this point in fall camp, but I wanted to share a lot of those clips with you because I thought they were really important, especially what he had to say about Elijah Simmons and Tyler Bear, and I thought that was huge. All right, we got Josh Ward, little Ward Wednesday, coming up next right here on Locked On Balls. But first, I do want to tell you about uh, our friends over at FanDuel. FanDuel has been a proud sponsor of the show. We uh, really, really do appreciate their uh, their support over here on Locked On Balls. Football season, it's about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you a chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, Okay, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Not bad, right? Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl and you'll get bonus bets for every single victory. 17 games in the regular season in the National Football League, right? Say you pick the Tennessee Titans every win, you get bonus bets. That's not bad at all. Over there at FanDuel Sportsbook, you can bet on spreads, player props, the totals, hit that over, hit that under, and a whole lot more. All you need to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, all right? Take some time to visit FanDuel and include money lines, props around your team. FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, guys, welcome back into Locked On Balls. It is your team every single day, and we got Josh Ward on for a little Ward Wednesday here on this Wednesday. You can follow Josh on Twitter at Josh underscore Ward. He's the co-host of Josh and Swain over at 991 The Sports Animal, noon to 3 every weekday. Josh, welcome to the show, man. Appreciate you being here. Good to be with you as always. All right, the coaches poll from the USA Today came out, debuted earlier this week. Tennessee coming in at number 10. Too high, too low, or... Just about right. I would put it in the about right category. I would have predicted in the 11 to 15 range. So a little higher maybe than I expected. But I think very fair when you look at the teams behind Tennessee. 
They have their own share of questions to answer. I think it's easy to look at Clemson one spot ahead of Tennessee and say, what's going on? Just saw the Orange Bowl, right? But it is a different team. It's a different season. And people have different criteria. Remember, it's an accumulation of points. So uh, there, I'm sure were a number of people that had Tennessee ahead of Clemson, but total points had up and Clemson ends up being just ahead. Some, some they'll look at it, okay, what's going to happen this season? I would vote in terms of what do I think they are right now? And then I'll adjust based on how the results go after that. So again, different criteria out there. So you can make a case for Tennessee being a couple of spots higher, but Hendon is gone. Darnell Wright is gone. Defense still has questions to answer. So top 10 to me is quite a compliment considering what Tennessee has to replace. You're exactly right. That's how I view it as well. It's uh, what, what do you think they are right now? I mean, there's, there's a reason we vote on this. Well, not the coaches poll, but the, you know, some voters in the AP vote on this every single week, right? Because, you know, mm-hmm. you, you win, you lose, other things happen. So that can change throughout the season. Um, we'll get into Tennessee fall camp here in a moment, but I look at this coaches poll and the top five teams, three of them have some serious quarterback. I don't want to say questions, but maybe some unknowns. Georgia mm-hmm. at one, we know who the starting quarterback is going to be, but he's an unknown. Alabama at three, no clue who that quarterback is going to be. And then Ohio State at four, we know who that quarterback is going to be, but still very much an unknown, whereas Michigan set at quarterback and Jaden Daniels at LSU at five. It just speaks to the volume of that roster and how those teams have recruited and obviously won over the course of the last couple of years. Yeah, Alabama has the biggest quarterback question, but also maybe the best roster in college football in terms of yeah. accumulated talent. I would still take Georgia and the Bulldogs are deserving of being number one, but there again, the number one team in the country has a new quarterback to break in with all those players around them. LSU is a team that's getting talked up for all those reasons. The roster is good. You have somebody like Mason Smith coming back. Then you have a quarterback who looks like he's probably more prepared entering this season as compared to a year ago when he had transferred in. So LSU deserves, I think, a lot of the attention that it gets. Tennessee, to come back to the Vols, I think it's a benefit of the doubt of what the offense is because Joe Milton still has questions to answer. But seeing him against Clemson, I think, created some confidence. Like if, if he had not played at the end of last season in that starting role, maybe Tennessee is a few spots later than uh, behind where it is right now. But there's more confidence in Joe than there probably was in the middle of last season when he had not played meaningful snaps as Tennessee's starting quarterback. So I think the offense, despite having to lose – uh, to replace receivers who have moved on and Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman, there's an assumption that the next guys up will do really well. Plus, Brew McCoy's back and Ramel Keaton is back. So I think what Josh Heupel has established offensively has given Tennessee a big benefit of the doubt. Then for Tennessee to be even better to compete with those teams who are the favorites going in, Georgia and Alabama, let's see what the defense is able to do. Is it better than a year ago? And can the offense truly keep pace with last season? You brought up a few of those names right there at the wide receiver position. Um, I know it's it's all about a quarterback. You got to get a quarterback that can efficiently get them the football. But and stop me if you disagree. I think the wide receiver group can be a serious strength. And it's so funny to say that because you lost the Blitnikoff Award winner and you lost Cedric Tillman, who was a thousand yard receiver in the past. Yet I think this receiver group with those four have a chance to be really dangerous. Yeah, maybe the position group I'm least concerned about for Tennessee. Yeah. Part of the part of it is because of the offense, but also because Brew McCoy's back. We've seen Ramel Keaton step up because he played so much last year after Cedric Tillman went down with his injury and was needed to make big catches and big games and did it. We saw Squirrel White. This is similar to Joe Milton. We saw him against Clemson step into a starting role with Jalen Hyde opting out of the game. So we've seen him do more than just catch bombs late in the game when everything was decided and his quickness. And then Dante Thornton comes in getting so much hype and hearing what Joey Halsley has to say about him with his freakish talent and athleticism. And then you see him out there on the practice field and he looks the part of what we've heard in in terms of six, five big guy that can move. So you combine that back to the offense. Yeah. I, I have no concerns about wide receiver. Is it time to sound the alarm? Is it over? Is Tennessee's offensive line going to be really, really bad this year? Or is it uh, just early in camp and, and they're working through some issues? But, you know, granted, they, they do have to work through some issues. Yeah, let's see. I'll be curious to find out what's said, at least after the scrimmage on Thursday, about how the offensive line has performed because the defensive line has some some impressive players, like the talk of Omar Norman Lott in the offseason and then what Rodney Garner said about him. 
yeah, that might give us a better idea of where Tennessee is at left guard and in that battle. Uh, let's see how they hold up. Tackles a question. Uh, Jeremiah Crawford deserves all kinds of credit for earning the spot that he's in, but he's also in a spot where he has to replace Darnell Wright, who was as good as it got in the country last year at his position. And then uh, John Campbell bringing him in was important, but again, let's see how he plays this uh, this upcoming fall. Glenn Ellerby is a good offensive line coach. Josh Heupel is a good offensive coach. I'm I'm expecting that they will be fine, but will they be really good against some of the best defensive groups they face? Like talking about interior defensive line play, some of the talk out of Florida after week one was, hey, they really like their interior defensive line. Okay, we well go to Gainesville week three. So how do you perform? Do you have left guard still as a question when you play in your first road game in the SEC? These are things that matter. So I, I doubt that they're where they were two years ago, giving up the most sacks in the SEC, but are they where they were a year ago where they could keep Will Anderson in check, somebody like that? Well, that that would be a big ask right now. Last thing, Josh, before we say goodbye, um, defense as a whole, and again, we'll know more tomorrow, scrimmage number one. We'll know more after scrimmage number two. And, you know, scrimmage number two for me is when you really start settling in, settling in and saying, okay, these are the guys, this is going to play and everything, which is why scrimmage number one is such a great opportunity. You show out here, you get more reps that following week, and – uh, these are all kind of dress rehearsals, but um, I feel like this defense, man, uh, front seven, I'm really impressed with. I think this defensive line could be a strength. Uh, the linebackers, a lot of young talent, veteran leadership there at the top, and you're deeper than you've ever been. Man, if you can just figure out that secondary, and that's a huge if, I get it, mm -hmm. but I, I like this defense early on in camp. Do you? Yeah, I do. Uh, the potential I like a lot more. Uh, so at the end of Josh and Swain on Tuesday, we do this power poll every day, and we ranked defensive position groups we're most confident in, one through five. And Swain and I had the same two. We differed in order, but it was very close. Uh, he had linebacker number one, uh, then defensive interior play. And I had defensive interior number one, then linebacker. But I, there's no way I would have said that about linebacker a year ago <laughs> or certainly two years ago. And that's how I feel right now because Keenan Peely comes in, then you have more depth, you have more talent, more athleticism with the newcomers. And, you know, a lot of people have brought it up at this point, but you're, you're really relying on Jeremy Banks and Jawan Mitchell part of the time. Well, now Keenan Peely coming in and Aaron Beasley being a year older and Elijah Herring being a year older, those concerns that existed for the coaching staff are gone, right? So you have more leadership, I think more playmaking, and that really, really is going to matter. And if they really can create more pass rush, that's a big question from the defensive line that Rodney Garner talked about well, then this defense can be better. If they struggle to pressure the quarterback, well, the secondary is just not going to be as good as it can be. But yeah. legitimate competition, how the secondary performs on Thursday, though, and what kind of pressure they're able to create, that'll, I'm sure, be two of the big topics for the coaching staff to try to evaluate. And and by the way, we'll play this game of, okay, they got pressured. Does that tell us something about the offensive line? There's, there's always that game you play. But, yeah, the defense has more potential than it has the last two years for sure. That would drive me insane if I was a head coach. Like, if I was a coordinator, hell yeah. But, like, if I'm a head coach, it's such a catch-22 because it's like, man, I'm really impressed that that offensive line, man, they kick butt. And mm -hmm. you're like, gosh, are they going to stop anybody? And then, of course, vice versa. Yeah, but but I can tell you uh, an example a year ago, Jalen Hyatt in a scrimmage, he beat a DB on a big play that a lot of people were excited about talking about it in, in the scrimmage. And he beat a DB that was going to end up not playing that big of a role. So it was difficult to say, okay, well, what exactly do we take from it? Well, what we ended up taking from it was that Jalen was going to be the Blitnikoff Award winner. So sometimes it can <laughs> both can be true that it's, well, yeah, they beat somebody that wasn't that good. But you, you want back and forth probably is what you're looking for, where both are winning because you're going to lose some anyway. Could be like 1998 though, right? Feels like it. <laughs> there you go. Set you up on a tee. Josh and, I about to say Josh and Ward. Josh and Swain, noon to three weekdays on 99.1 The Sports Animal. What's coming up the rest of the week? And of course, you got your newsletter on Friday morning. That's a better show I did. Josh and Ward. <laughs> Nobody's going to listen to it, but I'm going to pitch Said that no one, one ever except me yeah, just now yeah, with a yeah, microphone. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah uh, subscribe to the newsletter. We appreciate everybody that has uh, done that. It's free every Friday. And then, uh, yeah, the show's rock and roll, and we have all kinds of conversation. For uh, the spreadsheet lovers, those that love numbers, Bill Conley of ESPN, he's been as high on Tennessee as anybody in the country the last two years. Uh, Wednesday guest on Josh and Swain, uh, 1230, if you're listening to this ahead of time, or you can go back and listen, we always appreciate Bill's input. 
He's Josh Ward at Josh underscore Ward on Twitter. Appreciate you guys for joining us here on today's Wednesday edition of Locked On Vols. Fall camp continuing to roll on. We'll give you the highlights of Wednesday's practice. Set the tone for Thursday's scrimmage number one, and you'll have all that right here on Locked On Vols. Please listen, subscribe, follow all that good stuff on the YouTube channel, 8K by opening day. That's the goal. Uh, about 150 away, so we made a good push there. And, of course, wherever you get your podcast. For Josh Ward, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys for listening to us right here on Lockdown Balls.